physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain, and I am a psychotherapist, author, and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. And hello to Sean, our director in studio. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, our thoughts, our emotions, um, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I will share with you the tip of the week about forgiving someone for something they have done in the past and have actually corrected their behavior. Then I will bring you Eileen Manukian. She's the director of Gem Educare, talking about how she has brought awareness integration theory in the early childhood education, promoting emotional regulation for as young as two years old. It's amazing the work that she's done, and I really wanted to share it with all of you. And I'm excited about it since it is the uh, awareness integration theory. Then I will chat with my mentor and my teacher, someone who I really have learned a lot and I have the highest respect for, Dr. Michael Yapko. He's a clinical psychologist, a marriage and family therapist. He's internationally recognized for his work in developing strategic outcome-focused therapies and the advanced clinical applications of hypnosis. And he is the author of more than 15 books in the area of hypnosis. I love to hear from you, so connect with me through my website, fujan.com. Follow all of my social medias through Dr. Fujan Zain and message me with your comments and topics or questions so I can even answer them in the um, Ask Me segment. Today's program was so rich that I just didn't even have time for the Ask Me segment, but don't worry, ask me anyway, and I'll put it on the next segments. But first, here's the tip of the week. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. This is Dr. Fujan, and this is the tip of the week. So I've been talking to clients and colleagues about forgiving someone for something that they have done in the past and have corrected their behavior since then versus holding the resentment, the pain continuously, which ends up punishing them as well as us. I talked to a mother whose teen used to defy her and lie to her around age 12. As they both came to therapy and shifted their communication, the teen actually began respecting the boundaries that her mother had set for her and shared with her mother her thoughts and needs. However, even after three years, the mom kept treating her daughter as if the corrective behavior never happened. I spoke with a woman whose husband had cheated on her 22 years ago, and she had a meltdown then, of course. They decided to stay together, and he kept his promise of never betraying her again for the past 20 years. However, every day she has a meltdown about the affair and tells him how hurt she is because of what he did to her. 
I also spoke with a woman whose mother meddled in their marriage. And since they came from a kind of a tribal culture, she had no idea nor the skills to take a stand and set a boundary for her family of origin. However, after three years into the marriage, she got it. And um, she needed to tell her mother and she did talk to her mother. And for the past 15 years, she has not allowed her family of origin to interfere in their merit in uh, the marital affair and marital life. Every week when she wants to make a decision with her husband about her manner in her life, he accuses her of checking in with her mother. So what's the impact of holding on to an upset for a lifetime, even though the unhealthy behavior that we ask for has actually changed? Well, the answer is constant misery then, right? We got what we want, but we won't let it go. So in relationships, there are many occasions that we hurt each other by mistake, uh, misunderstandings, intentional or unintentional. It's important to clarify, share, take responsibility for what we have done, clean up, state what needs to be changed, be committed to the change. And if we don't get a chance to share and be heard, if the person who hurt us does not take responsibility for their action and how they have hurt us, if there's no request for a change of behavior and there's no commitment to change, of course, then we get stuck in the hurt, pain, and our grief. But it is important to recognize when a promise has been kept, has been kept, and times, and, have, and times have reassured us that the healthy behavior we requested is here to stay. It is also important for us to take the responsibility of healing ourselves, forgiving, moving on, and enjoying the relationship. When someone hears us and change their behavior to what we request, it is important to validate their effort and share our gratitude toward them. This positive attention motivates people to act in a healthy manner beside us. So when someone hears you and changes their behavior for you, forgive them and begin enjoying the relationship daily. For more observational skills and mending the past, go to my book, Life Reset, the Awareness Integration Path to Create the Love You Want. You can get that at fujan.com or Amazon. We'll be right back. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM dot com. Hello, welcome back again, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujan Zane, and I am excited to have Eileen Manukian with us. She is a specialist in um, young children and um, she is the founder and originator of uh, Gem Educare. And we're going to talk about why is this a unique method and approach? Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Zane. And um, I want to say hello also to your uh, audience and listeners. So um, I think most everybody who is with us has uh, heard a little bit, and I hope, and if not, they're going to hear, hear a little bit about the awareness integration model. And I remember that you and I had a conversation about the awareness integration model, which um, you had personally have uh, studied and experienced and all of that. And we were talking about how to have this as um, a proactive approach for children, that it does not have to be that people go through their life 
and um, learn and uh, do their you know trial and error things. And then somewhere around 20s, 30s, 40s, they come to uh, therapy and clinicians and attempt to clean up and then learn new skills about how to be. And how can we create these skills and bring it to um, you know children as, as young as an infant uh, to work with them directly in creating observational skills and also emo emotional regulation skills. And I know that many people say, well, children are supposed to have emotion. Nobody's having emotional regulation as a child. They're supposed to have that as an adult. And um, uh, you took on the concept of, no, let's figure out how to bring this model into the education of children directly as, uh, as young, young as an infant. And uh, you've had amazing experience the past three to four years with children from infancy all the way to six years. Can you share a little bit with us? Sure, definitely. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share uh, about how uh, amazing this model has worked on little children on a proactive manner. So when I was going through learning uh, the model, the first thing I noticed is as an adult, I was not aware of my feelings and I could not distinguish them from my thoughts. So that was the first thing I learned that my thoughts are very different than my feelings. If we don't know what the difference is, it's impossible to regulate the feelings because we are mixing the two together. So with very young children, what happens is they first need to know what feelings are and be able to um, name them and distinguish them from each other. So what we do is we start with infants by naming the emotions for them. And every time they are showing an emotion and young children, very young children, the little infants are full of emotions, but they only have the basic emotions at the beginning. So we start naming them. For example, if a kid is crying, we talk to them in an um, enunciated way, a little bit slower, but using regular words, not words that are only for young children. And we created it in, in our culture or in our home so they would actually understand what we're talking about. For example, if they are crying, I see that you're crying. Are you sad? Is this a sadness? Is this frustration? Are you hungry? Are you asking for my attention? So the child knows that when they are crying, it's a reaction to an emotion. And the emotion is either sadness, anger, frustration. We name them. And then you also <laughs> appear to name uh, what the reason could be. So you're distinguishing the act, which is the crying, and then the emotion, which is, would be the sadness or the frustration, and then the also because are you are you sad because you, you know, this is the thought process that you have or this is the need you have. So I'm hearing that uh, all of that is get, kind of being um, created for the for the infant to realize this is what's going on, and then they can take it on on themselves as as they start talking. Then they can actually uh, be reinforced to share and distinguish what's going on with their body and their thought process and their and attach it to their um, action of behavior that they're doing and then attach it also to kind of the result, the impact that they're creating. Exactly, but we do it in a way that is very clear for the child. This is what I'm doing, I'm crying because I'm feeling sad or the the other reason, the reason of it is because I'm hungry. The hunger causes sadness, which makes me cry. So it's very clear for the child. And then um, when they get a little bit older, um, closer to one year old, between nine months old to one year old, we all also start talking about the impact it has. For example, during that time, they put everything in their mouth because they're, they are teary. So we also, uh, and sometimes they take it out of their mouth and, and they throw it to someone which hits the other kid and creates another emotion for the other kid. So we sit them down and we ask them what happened? Were you trying to put this in your mouth because you were having uh, uncomfortable feelings in your mouth? And then, but when you threw it, you made your friend sad. That's what you wanted. And then we tell them that that's not what they want because they're very young. 
when they get a little bit older, they can distinguish that this is not what I wanted. I just wanted the, the toy to play or to put it in my mouth. I didn't want to cause anybody else distress or sadness. Um, and as they go, grow older and older, the process becomes a little bit more sophisticated. So we sit them down, we ask them the feeling, where is the feeling in your body? In the beginning, we tell them because they can't tell you. We tell them, is it in your throat? Is it in your chest? Is it in your hands? And then they tell us which part of the body is in reacting to the emotion. And then we teach them how we can actually release that energy, that emotion from the body. Let's close our eyes. Let's go to that part of the body. Let's release the emotion. And then, then we come up with a solution. That this was the reaction you had. You hit your friend. Next time, we don't want to hit our friend. So what do you think we should do? If they are younger, you have to give them three or four choices because they are too young to come up with a, with a solution. Afterwards, they come up with a solution and they get to four years old, five years old, they already have a lot of ideas about what they should do. So we tell them, do you want to go outside and run around when you feel anxious or when you feel frustrated or when you're angry? Or you want to sit down and close your eyes and meditate? So the education, <laughs> education that happens at that time, you, you say that, you know, we tell them and I'm sensing that it's a lot of education that is happening. Not only that is education of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, what to weigh with relatedness to other children and also relatedness to their own body. So as they're getting aware of their own body in that moment is a lot of physical need and an emotional need. And then that turns into action. And then as you share with them with your words, they pick up these words and associate it with each other and associate it also with the value system that a parent um, or a teacher wants to teach them, such as being kind and you know, not being violent, not hurting someone else. So all of those are kind of combined. And then as you systematically teach them, it appears that what I've seen at your school and uh, what you've done in the research um, not, not only you've had it with different children, but you've also had it with set of twins, actually two sets of twins that come to your school. And so obviously you're also doing studies of, uh, and research on twins as well as uh, different um, cultures uh, because your, your school is open to multicultural uh, children and with uh, families who come from different cultures together and even blended families who come from different cultures. And it seems like uh, this methodology is working across um, uh, cultures in a sense. So even if you have different cultures who come from the Western or the Eastern cultures or Middle Eastern cultures, um, they um, have the, the way of adaptability of uh, taking this and the parents can also take this to their home and continue with this way of distinction for their, for their children. I've also noticed that there has been a creation of an emotional regulation, which most of us um, think that a two-year-old has no capacity or capability of um, holding and taking care of their emotion. And every day we see at your school um, that they do, they actually do. Even a two-year-old has, has the ability to name, focus, see where it is in your body, how to release emotions and different types of emotions and how that type of an emotional regulation is supporting them in um, you know, excelling their, their learning capacity. Yes, exactly. I want to add one more thing that not only this works uh, cross-culturally and it also works on every age group of children, it also works perfectly with children who have learning disabilities or they have ADHD or they are autistic. We, we tried that on uh, children too and it worked beautifully. So it works on every single child in the world. And um, the other thing is with the emotional regulation that you mentioned, it's not only the kids that come to this school, it's also the children that I see as parenting coach because I do parenting coaching. So I teach them how to use this system with their children and it actually works. And uh, I have to mention that not only these two sets of twins that are in the school, I also parenting coach uh, a 
other set of twins that are identical. And it has been working on all of them. The parents who haven't gone through the system the way I have, that, that I, I was trained, I researched the uh, methodology, the theory of awareness integration, and I have been in that for so many years, but the parents who haven't been, if they know the steps, they can still help their children regulate their emotions. That's the beauty of this theory. And um, uh, yeah. Examples. Give us some examples. I remember one of the twins uh, came to you and uh, not only you had worked with him, he was actually now doing it with yes. you, trying to regulate your emotion. That is the cutest yes. stories that I've ever seen and heard. Yes. So one day, uh, apparently I was looking different to them and, you know, children can pick up immediately what's going on. I, um, I was in my own thoughts and the, one of the twins came to me and he said, what's wrong? Are you feeling sad? Are you frustrated? Let's sit down and take care of your emotions. And so she was he, only three years old at that. Yes, he was only three years old, yes. So he sat me down and he went through the whole process with me. And because it was so cute, I let him do whatever he wanted to do. So first he asked me, what, what is the feeling I have? What is the emotion? And then he asked me, where is it in my body? And then he said, now we are going to close our eyes. I'm going to hold your hands just so you feel comfortable. And then he started actually telling me how to release my emotions. And he said, next time, if you feel sad or you're upset, what do you want to do? You want to go run in the backyard? What do you want to do? So he asked me and I said, I think if I get a hug from you, I will feel better. He goes, that's very easy. Next time, just call me. I'll hug you. Don't feel sad. <laughs> so that's a very cute story. A couple of days ago, another child was very emotional. So over a very small stuff that were not even important at all, she would feel that she needs to cry. Um, and I, I tested the other twin, the other brother. I said, can you go and help your friend? I think she's a little bit sad. Can you help her with her emotions? He goes, yes, of course. And then he called the girl and he said, here, come sit here. Let's close our eyes and calm down a little bit. Then I'm asking, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. And then he started going through the process. How are you feeling? Where is it in your body? Let's really see, count to 10. And then he asked, are you feeling any better now? And the girl said, yes. I said, okay, I'm gonna hug you just in case you're, you, need to, you need a hug. And then we're gonna go play. And they did, they didn't even need me to interfere. <laughs> So one of the most beautiful thing I hear is that um, not only that they're using it for themselves, but they're also they're supporting their classmates in order to um, kind of like define, verify, release, and kind of like move on with the next step of their life. Um, another aspect of it beyond the emotional um, regulation that the children are learning the skills um, through as they're going, whether it's sadness or anger or frustration or, you know, any of it, like they want to ignite, they acknowledge that they have joy and they keep it, but they acknowledge that they might have some of the emotions and they can acknowledge to keep it and take care of themselves. And I know that you have like these beautiful bean bags that are around your, um, your classroom. And, you know, if they wanted to have a personal time and just be with their emotion, they get to go and sit. And um, it's not like a timeout that you have to go somewhere where they're getting punished. They just take a personal space a little bit away and they go into their body and kind of like release it for themselves. And whenever they're ready, they come back and join. So not only you've taught them all of these t different types of um, recognizing and moving forward with their emotion. One of the other um, results that I've experienced with your, um, with your group and, and kids of all ages is that they are a um, lot of solution oriented. They've, uh, they've become as independent as possible. Like the minute that they know like their developmental stage, um, the physical stage, uh, stage their motor uh, movement stage, all of those has the ability to do something that they are eager to be able to do that action, which raises their self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, so it's more of 
uh, also action oriented in learning things, being eager to learn things, being eager to do it on their own, being eager to find solutions on their own when they find an obstacle. And I also think that that is one of the things that this model has really promoted for your children. Can you share a bit about that? Yes, definitely. Um, they are very focused. That's the first thing I noticed. They are very focused from a very, very young age. Um, I had a few uh, children that joined when they were three months old. So the first one was way ahead of the developmental stages. And we thought she's just smart. She is an advanced kid. Second one, the same thing happened. Third one, the same thing happened. So on the fourth one, I started uh, noting down, I, I note down every um, developmental stage that they reach. And we noticed, no, it's not that they are very smart. It's the way we treat them that makes them this advanced in their um, age group. We even had a child who joined when he was nine months old and at nine months old, he couldn't even sit. He was very behind compared to his developmental stage. At one year and one month, at 13 months, it was walking already. So it really does make a big difference. So they get very focused. That's one of the advantages of it. They are way above their developmental stage because they can regulate their emotions. Their emotions are not paralyzing them from what they want to do. They pass through it very easily. They don't cry for one little thing for hours. They learn how to be independent through the model. Uh, and we encourage them with different um, activities. At a certain age, we ask them to take off their shoes and put sho their shoes on. I have a one-year-old who can put his, her shoes on herself. Uh, and that gives them a lot of self-confidence. Another thing that happens, which is, I think, amazing, is that they don't have fears. They don't have unnecessary fears. They are not scared of boogeyman. They are not scared of monsters. Um, they are not even scared of something that the fear that we say, which is, which is not a real scaredness. Um, so what happens is that allows them to, it opens all the opportunities. It allows them to grow faster. It allows them to achieve every task much faster. For example, then when they are starting to walk, they are not scared of falling. I have a very young one who's actually very small. She's only 10 months old and she started walking in their room uh, a few days ago. The next day she was walking all over the backyard, which is on very unusual because they normally need at least two weeks of walking inside the room until they get their confidence to walk around in the backyard. I couldn't even catch her. She was running around not letting me catch her. So these are the things that happen when we use the, the model. Yeah, the joy of learning, it seems like it comes up and mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they also understand exactly in what is it that they need to do in order to create a result for themselves. And it seems like that has become one of the most amazing thing that I've seen, which is because they're looking at themselves and observing and they create you know obviously you're creating a safe environment for them that within the safety of the environment watching here they're looking and moving forward into the next level obviously as a child we look at a grown-up our parents or our teacher to show us the first path so the the minute that the first path is shown the concept of dependency is not promoted. The concept of observe yourself and now look at what you've done, now recreate it, now focus on how to do it. And it seems like that's where the joy of learning shows up for them. And uh, they practice it and they become confident in it. And they own, like they own the concept of I can. And it's one of the most important thing for a child to, to know that I have the ability and that's where the self-confidence shows up. In one minute, um, if there's anything we haven't shared with our audience and you really want them to know about this approach uh, with children, please go ahead. Sure, um, in continuation of what you just said is that they don't get frustrated. They become persistent on trying and trying and trying until they get it. The interesting thing that happened this year is because of the schools went online, 
uh, a set of twins that I had, which were the first ones, had to go to school online to kindergarten. And I kept observing them because they do it from here. And what I noticed is they are very self-sufficient. Although the school is online, they don't get frustrated. If they can't do it as fast as the teacher tells them to do it, they very easily, they say, it's okay, I'll do it in the afternoon. I'll finish it in the afternoon. And they listen and they, uh, they have the love of learning of, if I don't understand this this way, it's okay. I can go and ask and somebody will explain it to me in another way. So okay. that's an amazing thing. One of the experiences that I witnessed in um, you had from infants um, all to the sixth grade in the same room at one point, yes. and then you're doing a particular art activity, and these kids sat there focused, doing the art activity for 90 minutes. Now that's like never, but I've never known that to happen, and I think the other parents were shocked because you videoed it, you showed it to the parents, and they were sitting doing an artwork. Not, I mean, it was, they weren't quiet. They were also chatting with each other, but very focused in completing the artwork. And we're talking different age group sitting together, doing art group art, uh, for 90 minutes. That is spectacular amount of focus and attention. Yeah, sometimes I get tired. For example, I'm reading them a book and they're like, read another one, read another one. It's an hour we are reading a book and they still want to read another one. I get tired, but they don't. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I hope that people um, will contact you. Go to gemeducare.com, um, find out about the approach. And if you need Eileen Manukian as a parent coach to work with you, you as a parent and your children, as a parent co coach of uh, this awareness integration theory, educational theory, uh, uh, where can they go to find you? They can go to gemeducare.com or they can just go to Eileen Manukian um, at any social media. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being on our show and we'll be right back. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back again. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I am so excited to have my guru, my teacher, Dr. Michael Yapko. He's a clinical psychologist and a marriage and family therapist. He's internationally recognized for his work in developing strategic outcome-focused psychotherapies. The advanced clinical application of hypnosis and active short-term non-pharmacological -pharmac treatments of depression. He routinely teaches at professional audiences all over the world. And to date, he's been invited to present his ideas and methods to colleagues in more than 30 countries across the continent and all over the United States. Um, he's written and authored uh, 15 books and his latest being the process-oriented hypnosis focusing on the forest, not the trees. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fujian. Glad to be back with you again. I have learned so much from you, not um, obviously uh, teaching, you know, learning from you from uh, as, uh, um, hypnosis, but I think people have a lot of myth about hypnosis. And um, as I learned hypnosis from you, there were so many different aspects of hypnosis. And one of the most important one was how do people make decisions? And you through hypnosis opened this concept for me of, how to distinguish between the way that people make decisions and kind of like put it subconsciously and live by it without re necessarily recognizing it. Um, so please share with us some of the myth and then some of the accuracy about how uh, this approach really works. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting to me as a practitioner and researcher and writer in the field how you know for the last half century uh, as much writing as we do as much research as we do how little people still understand hypnosis despite the fact that we try and educate people all the time 
uh, you know, the mythologies out there because of the stage hypnosis shows and the TV shows that use hypnosis as the basis for committing evil acts that the stars of the show have to figure out and solve the crime. Uh, so it's, but there's a whole nother world that most people don't really know about. And that is the world of the clinicians and the researchers who have been studying the, the questions of how is it possible for people to get so focused on doing things that they're doing that they don't notice them, their own injuries, you know, they're, they're out gardening and they don't notice until much later that they cut themselves and then it hurts. But meanwhile, it's been bleeding for the last hour and they never noticed it. How is it that people are capable of remembering things out of nowhere that you wouldn't expect them to be able to remember? Uh, and it's the, the study of hypnosis is really the study of attention. And it's people I'm sure have heard of mindfulness, which is often defined as attention without intention. And I would describe hypnosis as attention with intention. It's very goal oriented. But the mythology is that somehow you're going to lose control of yourself and, and give up control of your thoughts and behaviors. And somebody's going to take over your mind, essentially. And that's the mythology and, and all the different misconceptions that flow from that. And so people listening really need to appreciate all the serious clinicians and researchers like me. You know, if hypnosis was about losing losing control of yourself, it wouldn't interest me in the least. Nobody ever comes into a clinical practice and says, hi, will you help me lose control of myself? On the contrary, people are always looking for more control, not less. And I've never found a better way of empowering people, despite the myths to the opposite, empowering people to be able to regulate their own experience, to be able to learn how to manage their physical pain, to be able to learn how to manage their anxiety so they can go the places they want to go and do the things that they want to do, to be able to manage their moods so that they're not succumbing to the despair and hopelessness of depression. But it's just a, a fascinating thing that people have all of these hidden potentials that hypnosis can help activate. And when I use the word hypnosis, just keep in mind, we're talking about focus. We're talking about attention, being able to narrow your attention down to one specific thing and essentially building a frame of mind about whatever it is you're trying to do. I remember um, obviously using hypnosis a lot for uh, trauma releasing, which like you said, it was a lot of focusing, going back into the memories of uh, an event that happened and the kind of decision-making that a person made. But I think one of the most important experiences that I've ever had in my life, and it was right after I got the class from you, was, um, and it, it talks about how you share um, in how the, the person can actually control their body and everything about their body. Um, was I saw in your class um, this um, experiment that was done with somebody putting their hand in ice, numbing it, and then going going ahead and numbing the different aspects of their body. And I had one um, uh, young uh, lady who showed up and said that she had a lot of um, um, adverse reactions to the drugs that they were using for dental work with her. And she had to have dental surgery and she just couldn't uh, use any of the uh, chemicals that they would have to use for her and do anything. So then what happened was she asked, she found me and she asked if I could support her. And I had just seen and came out of your hundred hour of hypnosis training and had seen that. And I'm like, well, let's try it. It was spectacular. I went to her, to her dentist's office. We had done this in my office first, you know, getting her ready in how to numb her, her hand and then how to numb her own, uh, you know, hold it to her uh, face and numb her dental we did the whole dental surgery and the dentist was like, okay, I thought all of this was hoax. It is amazing of what I just witnessed here. And well, that's when you, you know that the person has the ability to focus and actually be in control versus not being in control. Well, you, you get credit both ways. You know, the, the credit you get for being willing to try because one of the things, of course, you never really know how somebody's going to respond until you're doing it with them. 
and then the credit that your your client gets for being willing to try, being willing to experiment. And what an extraordinary thing for her to discover that she has this ability to regulate pain in her body in ways that if you hadn't created the situation for her to discover that, she could have gone her whole life never knowing that she was capable of this. And for me, that's, that's one of the things I just love about hypnosis is you create this interaction where you're really engaged with, you, with each other and you're really focused on whatever it is you're focusing on trying to achieve. And this person ends up responding in ways that they would, have, they would never have known that they had that capability. What does that do to someone's self-image to discover they have this ability? How does it push somebody in the best of ways to start to redefine who they think they are and what they think they're capable of? And it's that expansiveness that I find so powerful and so wonderful about hypnosis. That's what got me attracted to it literally 50 years ago and has kept me engaged with it every day of my life since. And uh, you know, I, I just love hearing stories like that. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I say credit goes both ways, that you were willing to try and were willing to co-create that experience and set her up to discover an ability she didn't even know she had. So with all the um, all that's going on, obviously with the COVID and um, raising of depression and anxiety and a lot of OCD and phobias through this time, um, and I know that you've uh, received awards in how you have brought hypnosis um, for uh, treating depression into the world, and you have many books about that. Can you share a little bit with our audience of uh, how can they uh, utilize hypnosis at this time in their life in order to, one, release some of the pressure that's uh, on them for any reason, whether it's grief or depression or anxiety that has come about for this past year for them? Well, it's a, a multifaceted answer. You know, the, the first thing is you, you, if, if you've never done hypnosis before, trying to do it by yourself is not likely to be helpful at the beginning. It will be a little bit later when you've learned how to reproduce the hypnotic experience and engage in self-hypnosis. But the, really the first step then would be finding a professional, somebody who is licensed and qualified as someone who can treat that same condition without hypnosis. That's been one of the guidelines all along. If you're not qualified to treat it without hypnosis, you're certainly not qualified to treat it with hypnosis. So to, to find someone who is a qualified professional is a starting place. The American Society of Clinical Hypnosis is the largest national organization in the United States. I know your show reaches around the world. There's also the International Society of Hypnosis, which is the umbrella organization for hypnosis societies all over the world, including one in Iran. So it's important that people can uh, go to the ISH website, ishhypnosis.org is the International Society of Hypnosis website, and you'll see member countries and a qualified professionals within that country. So, but then when you have the experience of it, you present whatever the problem is, you know, the, the, what the person's really learning to do with you is learning to shift your quality of focus. You know, one of the ways to think about problems is as problems of focus and specifically the quality of focus as well as the direction of focus. So people who are prone to depression, for example, typically focus on the hurts of the past, the unchangeable past. So when you start focusing on who's hurt you and when they hurt you and how they hurt you or what happened in your life that hurt you, there's really no vehicle for moving ahead. All you can do is rehash all the same things that you've already been rehashing. So what somebody who's good with hypnosis will do is use the hypnosis to very gently kind of grab your attention and redirect it. You know, we, we can't change the past, but we can learn from it and start to develop new goals for yourself that empower you and make your life worth living and, and, and bring new experiences in that expand you in ways that make you feel good so that you don't have to be depressed or 
when, when people are anxious, they're typically doing two things. They're overestimating the risks that they face and they're underestimating their own personal resources. So what somebody with hypnosis is gonna do is teach you something about how to assess risk more realistically, things that you don't really need to be afraid of. But when somebody can't distinguish the differences between an imaginary fear, what you are, what you conjure up in your mind that you're afraid of versus what's really a threat out there. Uh, and, and what a difference when you respond to the actual level of threat, which is typically much smaller than how big somebody anxious makes these threats. And then the other side of it, knowing what your resources are, that here's a situation that, okay, it's challenging, but I have the resources to deal with this and here's how I'm gonna deal with this. So that's, that's how hypnosis would get used to help people better manage anxiety, better manage depression by having some very realistic steps to follow of if I'm going to succeed, where should my attention be? What should I be focused on that's gonna be helpful to me? Focusing over here isn't gonna help me, focusing over here will. And to be able to evolve that ability to regulate your attention and know where it needs to be to get the job done, that's really what the artistry of living well is. You know, it's the uh, first thing you learn when you study hypnosis. You'll remember this from when you took the class. The very first things I talk about are how what you focus on determines your quality of life. And what a difference to focus always on what's wrong and, and instead of focusing on what's right. Absolutely. For all the clinicians and um, not just the clinicians of uh, psychotherapy, but I remember you had uh, physicians in your class. So for all of our audience who is interested in learning and practicing hypnosis, the 100 hour course is amazing. And I've gone through a lot of different types of courses, all my, the 30 years for hypnosis and yours by far is mastery. So I really thank you for that. And for everyone, please you know, take that on, you go to yapco.com um, and, um, and and sign up for that. Dr. Yapko, your latest book um, is um, Process-Oriented Hypnosis, focusing on the forest, not the tree. Is that written for professional uh, counselors or is it also for public? No, it's written for therapists. It's, a, it's meant to reach a professional audience. Mm -hmm. uh, the book actually comes out next week. Uh, yeah, so... I'm looking forward to its release. I'm really happy. It's been the uh, Amazon number one new release in hypnosis book for the last eight weeks consistently. So Can people- It's a little bit of a peek to all of the uh, therapists uh, who are watching us or listening to us. And we'll, you know, this gets shared to all of the um, social media with all of the therapists there. So can you give us a little bit of a peek sure. what uh, they are going to expect from it? Yeah, well, the book's written for people who already have some trading in hypnosis, but it's really meant not just for hypnosis practitioners, but for therapists of any kind, because it really is, uh, promotes a different viewpoint about treatment, that instead of going backwards in people's lives and trying to explain why they're having the problems that they're having, you know, and, and speculating about causes and, and all the underlying psychodynamics and all the things that therapists typically focus on. I'm less interested in the question of why this person has the problem. And I'm far more interested in the question of how they generate the problem. And it, it, by, by calling it process oriented, it's meant to be a direct diversion away from getting lost in the content of someone's problems. So just as a really simple example, somebody who's depressed who comes in and they literally start telling me about all the ways they feel victimized by people and by life. So they'll say to me, you know, my spouse does this to me and my kids do this to me and my boss does this to me and my neighbors do this to me and here's what my friends did to me. And they, they put themselves in this victim position. And that, you know, it doesn't mean people aren't genuinely victimized. Obviously, bad things happen to people. 
But for the people who recover, they get out of that framework and how am I gonna reclaim control of my life? So what process orientation means is I don't need to listen to the details of each story of somebody victimizing you. I can listen to five minutes of it and okay, I got it, I understand that you, you've been a victim of all these people in all these circumstances. Do you wanna get control back of your life? And here's how to do that. So instead of spending hour after hour of therapy, listening to the hurts and the pains and all the bad things that have happened, what process orientation, whether it's in hypnosis or just in therapy in general is about, is how do we move people to their goals? What are the skills they're gonna to need to have if they're gonna accomplish what they came to therapy to accomplish? And it, it's a, certainly a much briefer approach. You know, oftentimes people will come to therapy because they've never had a chance to tell their story before. And if that's the case, okay, I can listen. But even then, it doesn't have to be session after session after session. How can we start to move this person forward so that while they're in treatment, they're not still adding more stories of victimization to their life? You know, I don't want them coming in and saying, well, here's what happened to me this week. Uh, you know, I, I want them really to be able to move forward. So it's about skill building. It's about focusing on the future and developing the steps to get to that future of what the goals are, what this person wants for themselves. And that's the, uh, the essence of it, is um, being able to focus on how people can uh, resolve things. And, and that's based on understanding how they get stuck in the first place. So, so it's a different approach because I think what most people do is they focus on people's motivations that you, know, you, you must wanna be depressed. I've heard that a million times. Yeah, and nobody, nobody wants to be benefit that they hold. Yeah. Uh, that unconsciously they somebody holds a benefit on that exactly. and I'm, I'm exactly. here to say yeah it, it, obviously it's working somehow but to actually look at how is it working for them and yeah. then shifting that concept for them it's a, it's a fork in the road you know if you can either go down the path of motivation you must have some unconscious need for the problem or you must have some unconscious fear of success or fear of rejection or fear of failure and I'm, I'm not there. I'm, I'm at the point of, you know, just because somebody wants something doesn't mean they have the ability to do it. And so I, I'm going down the pathway of exploring, if this is what you want in your life, do you have the skills to produce it? Just because you want it isn't enough. In the same way I would say, you know, that you might be intensely motivated to watch the sunset, but if you face east, you're not gonna see it. Exactly. <laughs> um, one minute left. Is there anything that uh, we haven't shared that, that you really, really want our audience to know about uh, hypnosis? I would want people to uh, appreciate that hypnosis has been now at the forefront of neuroscience, that there's a very huge scientific basis for it, that serious researchers and serious clinicians want to know how it is in hypnosis, people are able to generate these amazing responses like your client did with the dental work. That if, if this is a human potential, how do we access it? If people have these hidden strengths, how do we connect them to it? And so studying hypnosis and the qualities of attention of hypnosis that engage people and connect them to their skills is, is such an important domain of inquiry that I would, I would hope people listening to this would be curious enough to want to do even a little bit of reading about some of the science of hypnosis and how it can be used clinically, therapeutically, to help people that previously felt like there was just no, no help coming. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for being on the show. For everyone, please go to uh, yapco.com and... Uh, uh, you have more there. You have a lot of books also for the public that it's written uh, for the public about depression, about how to um, organize their thought process, and um, many, many books for the clinicians. And, and one about hypnosis called Essentials of Hypnosis, that is a much easier reading, non academic type book that people might find helpful. So. 
And you also have an app, Mindsight. Mindset. Mindset. Uh, mindset that you can find also in all of the app stores. Uh, that, it, that it also has a lot of your um, um, actual uh, your your voice and hypnosis. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. You know, it's a phone app that people can use 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hypnosis sessions for all kinds of issues that people have. And, you know, mental health apps now have become a huge thing because of how convenient they are and how much support they offer, even in between sessions when people are already in therapy. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you for everyone who's out there. Create an amazing world for yourself and everyone around you. Thank you so much, Fuja. Thank you.